All right. So I do believe we are in for a treat. I think Dr. Allende Bonifacio, you are in the house, aren't you? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Hello. And you are going to tell us all about the ban on Walt Whitman's poetry, correct? Yes. That is wonderful. And I will let you take over. Great. So I'm just going to share my PowerPoint with everyone here. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Let's see. Let's get it. I'm just going to time myself also just to make sure I stay, keep my time. Um, so first of all, thank you, Paulette and everyone for inviting me. Um, and thanks uh, to all those viewing us now and who will view us later. Um, I want to first acknowledge that I am speaking from the land of the Ottawa, Seneca, and Erie peoples. On July, and I'm just going to be reading because that's what English professors do. <laughs> On July 4th, 1855, a little known poet from West Hills, New York, decided on a small print house in Brooklyn to print his first book of poetry. As a trained typesetter or printer's devil, as typesetters were often called, he set the type on 10 pages of poetry himself. The poet's name was Walt Whitman, and the book was Leaves of Grass. The first edition of Leaves of Grass was, a, appeared without Whitman's byline on the title page, leaving his identity up for conjecture. Curious readers interested in the unknown identity of the poet looked to the poet's frontispiece, which featured a stipple engraving of a discreetly outfitted bearded young man gazing at the reader as he stood with his left hand in his pocket and his right hand on his hip. This, quote, carpenter portrait, as it became known to some critics, represented the poet as a working class person whose unadorned fashion deviated from traditional and stodgy depictions of the period's lettered men. One contemporary reviewer writes, Quote, this portrait expresses all the features of the hard Democrat and none of the flexible delicacy of the civil, civil, civilized poet. The damaged hat, the rough beard, the naked throat, the, the, the shirt exposed to the waist are each and all presented to show that the man to whom those articles belong scorns the delicate arts of civilization. The man is the true impersonation of his book, rough, uncouth, vulgar. It was by the merest accident that we discovered the name of this erratic and newest wonder. By the time of Whitman's death in 1892, Leaves of Grass went through eight editions and grown five-fold in size. This book would go on to influence some of the biggest names in poetry, including Lanston, Lanston Hughes, Adrian Rich, June Jordan, and Joy Harjo. Today, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass is requi a required text in many English class classrooms from elementary school to my own, to my own college courses. And, and in fact, I will be teaching Walt Whitman Whit Walt Whitman's poems today, later, to my Utilito students. Although Leaves of Grass is canonized and widely read, a widely read text today, Whitman's many editions of Leaves of Grass were not praised or revered in the early career years of the poet. In fact, critics and readers and reviewers abhorred the poems for their secular and sensual content and its lack of conventional, um, its lack of conventional formal structure. During Whitman's lifetime, poetry was still seen as traditionally formulaic in meter and content. Whitman's critics uh, could to, would and could not anticipate the impactful cultural significance of Leaves of Grass. 
From the very beginning, however, the poet from Long Island anticipated that Leaves of Grass would leave a timeless imprint on the still budding tradition of American poetics. Jeffrey Saunders Scram writes for the Whitman Archive, which holds the most comprehensive record of works by Whitman and about Whitman, that Whitman's poems, quote, invoked the tradition of Homer and Virgil in putting the history, politics, and culture of the nation state to verse. Quote, the greatest poet forms the consistence of what is to be from what has been and is, Whitman wrote. He drags the dead out of their coffins and stands them again on their feet. He says to the past, rise and walk before me that I may realize you. He learns the lesson. He places himself where the future becomes present." End quote. The ebb and flow of past and present is a common trait in Whitman's poetics. In Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, one of my students' favorite poems, Whitman's speaker describes a pre-Brooklyn Bridge quotidian scene of commuters on a ferry boat crossing the East River from Brooklyn to Manhattan. The speaker meditates on the time and space between contemporaneous and future readers. They write, quote, in you that shall cross from shore to shore years hence are more to me and more in my meditations than you might suppose, end quote. These lines suggest a relation with prospective readers that required the longevity of Whitman's work. The romantic address to a timeless reader is what draws many, including me, to Whitman's work. His romanticization of common US American structures, landscapes, labor, people, states, define what he understood of American character and expression. Whitman was attentive to what Ralph Waldo Emerson called a meter-making argument of everyday American life the idioms, vernacular, slangs of American people, and the nature they inhabited. Leaves of Grass was a response to Emerson's lecture, The Poet, where, quote, the stage of Concord, as he's known, as, as he's known in, in my classroom, at least, um, writes that the, that the poet is the sayer, the namer, and representative of quintessential American beauty. After listening to Emerson's lecture, Whitman famously said that, quote, I was simmering, simmering. Emerson brought me to a boil, end quote. This boil was a book about Americans whirring around him, where, as he writes in Bly Blue, on, By Blue Ontario's Shore, these states are the amplest poem. Leaves of Grass was a, a speculation of what American poetry could look and sound like. Whitman's catalog-esque lines mimicked the expanse of the U.S. while at the same time critiquing the attitude of manifest destiny, the institution of slavery, the Civil War, U.S. imperialism, and the U.S.-Mexico War. It was Whitman's stated purpose, as we find in the preface to Leaves of Grass, to write the U.S. into a poem. Quote, the United States themselves are essentially the greatest poem. He said, adding, quote, past and present and future are not disjoined, but joined. Whitman's belief of the United States as a poem was a symptom of the U.S.'s intellectual revolution in the 19th century. Throughout this period, U.S. authors, including Washington Irving, James Fenimore Cooper, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Margaret Fuller, Herman Melville, Charles Chestnut, and Francis Harper, as, as well as many others, echoed the ethos of Americentric literature and intellectual life, which sought to do away with Anglo-centric attitudes towards culture and society. In other words, they were writing books that were, for the most part, devoid of European influence and adoration by demarcating a distinctly American expression and literature. Of all of them, Scram argues that, quote, it was Whitman, who, with his barbaric yawp, was the most radical in avowing that American identity 
was inextricable from the nation's central premise of self-government, governance and equality, end quote. In Whitman's famous poem, Song of Myself, the speaker, for example, accentuates the democratic value in American society, quote, the genius of the United States, he pronounced, is in the common people. So if, if Whitman was so great, right, why is the title of my talk today, The Ban on Walt Whitman? Well, as Whitman tried to bring readers together in poems that emphasized American expression and character with speakers that were universally connected, many readers rallied around the dogged controversies of his personal life. Walt Whitman never publicly addressed his sexual orientation in his poems, essays, or lectures. Biographical materials, however, note that he was involved for decades with an Irish-born streetcar operator named Peter Doyle. And in works like the Calamus poems in his Leaves of Grass collection, Whitman discusses romantic and sexual relationships between men. Penny novels of a popular form of fiction in vogue among American readers at the time treated sexual desire as profane, something with which Whitman took issue. Whitman's poems were often censored because of their treatment of sex, sexuality, and the human body. In section five of, this, of Song of Myself, the speaker describes a, describes a sensual scene between the speaker's soul and the lyrical eye. Quote, how you settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you held my feet, end quote. These lines partake in an ancient poetic tradition of envisioning a dialogue between the body and the soul. The difference, however, is that instead of claiming the soul victorious over the human flesh, as was common, the body and, and soul are equally triumphant, joining in ecstatic reciprocation. In section 24 of Song of Myself, Whitman writes, divine am I inside and out, and I make holy whatever I touch or am touched from. The scent of these armpits is an aroma finer than prayer. This head is more than churches or Bibles or creeds. If I worship any particular thing, it shall be some of the spread of my body, end quote. In this section, the human body, that of the speakers and others, is sanctified and has the capability of making what it touches holy. The central elements of the poem, the musky aromas it invokes, the heads of peoples, are greater than prayer. This phrenological collapse of church and body is one of the things readers found controversial and repulsive. Reviewers of Whitman's book took offense to his uncensored poems. One reviewer writes in 1855, quote, the very nature of this man's compositions excludes from proving by extracts the truth of our remarks. But we who are not prudish emphatically declare that the man who wrote page 79 of Leaves of Grass deserves nothing so richly as the public executioner's whip. Walt Whitman libels the highest type of humanity and calls his free speech the true utterance of a man. We, who may have been, who may have been misdirected by civilization, call it the expression of a beast. In 1856, on the release of the second edition, the Christian Examiner writes, so then these rank leaves have sprouted afresh and in still greater abundance. We hope that they had dropped and we should hear no more of them. But since they thrust themselves upon us again with a pertinacity, pertinacity that is proverbial of noxious weeds, and since these 32 poems threaten to become several hundred, perhaps a thousand, we can no longer refrain from speaking of them as we think they deserve. For here is not a question of literary opinion principally, but of the very essence of religion and morality. The book might pass for merely he hectoring a ludicrous, 
if it were not something a great deal more offensive. We are bound in conscience to call it impious and obscene. After the publication of the fifth edition in 1874, an offended critic writes, quote, his poems have suffered the unusual fate of such abnormal productions. It has been considered that admiration of them must be a kind of voluntary eccentricity, a gracious flourish in the face of respect respectability and orthodoxy. And it cannot be denied that he has not altogether escaped the, the, that worst of all calamities to a literary man, the admiration of the incompetent, end quote. In 1882, Oliver Stevens, the district attorney of Boston, banned the 1881 edition, an edition that Whitman constructed to resemble a Bible because the, because the sexuality charged poems violated, quote, the public statues concerning obscene literature. Stevens also threatened Whitman's publisher with criminal prosecution at the urging of the Society of the Suppression of Vice, causing a, a proposed new edition to be withdrawn from publication. Many booksellers agreed to neither publicize nor, con nor recommend Leaves of Grass to customers. To these attempts to censor and cancel his book, Whitman responds in an 1891 essay titled A Backward Glance, where he affirms the role of sex in his lines. Whitman writes, Leaves of Grass is avowedly the song of sex and the madness, and even animality. Of this feature, I shall only say the espousing principle of those lines so gives breath of life to my whole scheme that the bulk of the pieces might as well have been left unwritten where those lines omitted, end quote. Many critics also found faults in poems where Whitman explores the divinity of the human body. Scram posits that, quote, Whitman believed the human body was the sacred creation of God and sexuality was God given. He dismissed the platonic divide between the body and the soul and ex exhorted his readers to see the divine in themselves and in one another, as well as in his poems, end quote. For example, in A Song of Occupation, Four Occupations, Whitman writes, we consider the Bibles and religions divine. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give life, it is you who give the life. Leaves are not more shed from the trees or trees from the earth, and they are shed out of you. Well, so, while some readers fam famously, Emerson and Thoreau, welcomed Whitman's iconoclasm, many others found his words sacrilegious. Rufus Griswold, the former British Baptist minister turned journalist, believed that the ideas and words in Leaves of Grass were so vile that he could not reprint them. Quote, in our allusions to this book, uh, Griswold explained in his review published in the Criterion, we have found it impossible to convey any, even the most faint idea of its style and contents and of our disgust and detestation of them without employing language that cannot be pleasing to ears polite." End quote. To conclude, it is evident that Whitman's poetry voiced controversial and revolutionary views regarding contemporaneous opinions about sex, sexuality and the human body, defying the conventional and traditional silence that surrounded those subjects during his lifetime. Whitman's spirited sanctification of the, the human body was met with detestation and reservation that affected the poet's professional and private life. At the same time, these poems created new epistemes for imagining the conjoined futures of democracy and love. In Whitman's Poetry the and the Body, um, a book by Jimmy Killingsworth, Killingsworth argues that, quote, Whitman's poems proclaim love and democracy as the great products of human evolution and the great hope of the future, end quote. Whitman's er eroticization of political love 
delivered excitement to the topics of sex, sexuality, and spirituality in ways that Killingworth posits carved new linguistic paths to political consciousness. Despite the spate of reviews on Basting Whitman's guileless depictions of sexual desire and politicians and publishers' censorship, Leaves of Grass still remains one of the most influential books uh, to have ever been printed. And with that, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I am the, am I saying your name right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> and tell us again, I had wanted to do that and then I was sick all week and I just was kind of on half speed. Whose land are we broadcasting from? You need your mic on, I am the. Oops, okay. So, I mean, um, many lands, but I just mentioned Ottawa, Seneca, and the Erie peoples. Um, Kickapoo, know. I mean, there, there are a lot of, a lot more um, nations to mention. Erie and Kickapoo, we'll go with those. 